Welcome to the Art of Liberty, the unauthorized radical libertarian podcast with George Donnelly and John Tyner. If you want to maximize your freedom in the real world today, this is the podcast for you. Today is Monday, August 5th, 2013, and our topic is Who's the bad guy? The government or corporations? Well, John, it's another good morning. How are you today? It is. I'm good. How are you? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling really good. I'm feeling optimistic about the direction, um, you know, that everything's heading in. And it, it's been kind of nice lately because for some reason, uh, a whole bunch of people have been calling me or uh, writing me talking about how we can do business together. So, um, nice. yeah, so that, that's encouraging because that, that's one of the things I want to do. I want to I want to be involved in more agorist business and I want to, you know, help help people, you know, launch their businesses or grow their businesses, stuff like that. Yeah, you seem like you've been crazy busy lately. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I mean, it's that's one of those good problems to have though, right? Well, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> I, su- I it, suppose, yeah. <laughs> with Shield Mutual, it's it's uh it's 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 not always it, – it's complicated because people – you know, one person right now can pay me a very small amount of money and then right. go to jail for months, you know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I feel, you know, honor-bound to, to at least, you know, stay on, on top of their situation. Right. So, yeah. So, for yeah, example, saw- Adam Kokesh, I'm, I'm in the red on him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw um- – I think it was a few weeks or maybe even a month ago when you posted some question, you know, what can Shield Mutual do for you? And somebody got on there and was like, this guy should charge different amounts. So like people who are more likely to get themselves into trouble, pay more money. And I was like, man, I got to get in on this before George figures out that he needs to start doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm actually considering a, a different uh, structure, you know, so that it's easy to get in and then. Maybe the first couple incidents are, you know, covered, but then, you know, once you get into three or four incidents in a year or more, um, then, you know, it, there may be an additional cost. The problem yeah. is when somebody gets arrested, like I can't just call them up and be like, hey, um, you know, I need uh, $100 in order to continue service <laughs> because first of all, it's not practical. And second of all, that's, that's pretty, pretty, that would be a crappy thing to do. Yeah, it seems like more like you'd have to wait till their dues renew, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's like what people say about the uh, the libertarian firefighting companies, which I, I don't think is really true. But you know, they're like they roll up to the your house on fire, and they're like, okay, pay us five thousand dollars, and we'll put your house, uh, you know, put out the fire. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny that you bring that up. I got a. Um, it's been like a couple of years now, but I was ta- I was discussing libertarianism with some friends of mine, and it was right around the time um, that that house, I think it was in Tennessee, and the local fire department let it burn. Mm-hmm. Be- I remember that. Because, um, you know, the, they were actually on some kind of model where the people out in the sticks kind of had to pay an extra 75 bucks or whatever it was, and this guy just decided not to pay it. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were telling this story about, I guess, way back in like the 1800s. Um, you know, firefighting companies were private and they would basically race out to wherever there was a fire. And if two of them showed up at the same time, they would kind of duke it out in the streets to see who could, who was going to put out the fire (laughs) while, you know, while the house burns, they're blooding each other in the streets. (laughs) So these guys are basically like, well, this is what would happen. And I was like, you know, that might happen for a short period of time, but it's not going to take very long before these companies either go out of business or their workers quit because they're tired of getting beat up in the streets. You know, like that's a problem that's going to correct itself pretty quickly. Well, yeah, it's, it, it's something I've said before that, you know, we can only be as – liberty only enables us to be as good as we can be. So if we're a bunch of, you know, mouth-breathing brutes – then, you know, obviously, no matter how much liberty we have, we're not going to produce a space shuttle. But right. if we, you know, if, what if we can rise above that on an individual basis and become more reasoned and more intelligent and more calm and more educated, then the sky's the limit. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, like I said, I, I just tell them at least that that to me seems like a self-limiting problem. You know, you're not going to continue to fight fires if it means you got to go out and get into a brawl every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Yeah. Hey, so um, 
Uh, just a, just a quick one. Um, there's this show called Gold Rush on Discovery. I don't know if you've heard of it or not. Um, is that the one where they they follow the the gold miners? Yeah, and they've yeah, been up in like Alaska for the last couple years. Yeah, so there's a new season, and they're at least in the first episode, they're looking around down in South America for places oh, to mine. Really? And, yeah, and they ended up in Peru, and it just caught my attention because they went to some mine, and they called it the Lamada Mine. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess that mine's run as a co-op. Interesting. So was, yeah, it was it was interesting. Like I tried to find some information about it online, and the only thing I found looked like it was in Spanish, and it looked like at least you know my Spanish is really bad, but it looked like it might have been some kind of like articles of incorporation kind of document. Uh huh. Um, but yeah, it was just kind of interesting to hear the narrator and the the guy went down there and they were trying to negotiate for a piece of land from these guys. And he was like, it's real hard because, like, there's nobody I negotiate with. Like, when we wanted to negotiate, basically all 20 of the miners had to come into this room and I had to give them all my pitch, you know. (laughs) And he was like, I couldn't get a read on anything because there were 20 guys in the room, you know. So then they want to make a decision. So, like, they kind of kicked them out and they had kind of a closed door powwow. Uh Um, But even the, even the, uh, the narrator was kind of like, oh, you know. There's no one person that he can deal with. You know, it's this group of people and he's got to ask them, you know, they've got to make the decision as, as, as a group. That's cool. So yeah, it was kind of, it was interesting, but yeah, I just, they didn't talk about it very much and I couldn't find a lot of information on it, but yeah, I just, I heard you talk about cops before. So it just caught my attention when, when they were talking about it. Here in Colombia, um, the cooperative is a very popular means of organization for people who uh, are of limited resources. You know, in the United States, you see poor people often doing very self-destructive things um, and not really organizing for their own benefit. But here in Colombia, you still see some of those self-destructive things. But by and large, the people of limited means... um, they they take very good care of themselves and they're looking for ways actively to improve them their, themselves and so they have dozens and dozens and dozens of co-ops for everything under the sun um and uh and i, I there's even a mutual i i saw that has a uh i think it's life insurance or health insurance or something that they have an office at the one of the main uh metro stations uh downtown and uh, it's really cool to see that. There are a lot of examples of, um, you know, kind of um, the direct action, dual power uh, kind of a thing here in Colombia. And it's it's really encouraging to see it in, in action. Is there a difference between a mutual and a co-op? Um, you know, I'm not sure because I think mutual has been mostly abandoned. Uh, I think mutual here might just be another name for like a nonprofit, what we would call a nonprofit. You know, it's just for the mutual benefit of the people who are members or customers or whatever so you know all right yeah i was just i was just curious i'm not not very familiar with either model very much co-ops are really cool when i was in college i belonged to a um a co-op supermarket in hyde park there in chicago and Mm -hmm. uh it was really nice it was really well run i mean of course it was right next to a big university so i mean it's you know they have PhD stock in the shelves and stuff. But. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder. If, now that we're talking about this, I think REI is run as a cooperative. REI, yeah, um, Recreational what? Equipment Inc. Uh oh, right. Yeah, I bought a tent think, from them. I think. Yeah, they're they're really good. I like buying their outdoor stuff. But I'm trying. I think there are a co-op, and you, like you become a member. You know, you can buy in. You pay like twenty dollars or something like that, and you become a member. Mm-hmm. Um. They kind of sell it as you give them twenty dollars and you basically get ten percent off of full priced items for life. Um, but nice. then they pay a di- but then like basically they pay that back to you as some kind of dividend. But I think it's a co op. But at the same time, like it's kind of odd because they don't really expect me to do anything, and you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like I don't feel like I'm an owner at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe I own such an intent- infinitesimally small share that it just doesn't matter. Yeah, this supermarket that I was uh, a member of, they they had annual meetings and they sent out the um, what is it the the dividend? You know, I got a check every year, and and then when I went to shop, uh, I would get when I gave them my number, I would get like one percent off of of the bill. I think it was yeah. one or two percent, something like that. I think it yeah, changed I, every year, actually. 
Yeah, it's, it sounds to me, I think REIs run exactly the same way. But like I said, it, to, to me, it doesn't seem any different than a private company, or I guess I should say public company that has shareholders. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the difference is. I assume there's some kind of tax break involved with being a co-op as opposed to, um, as opposed to some public corporation, you know, like maybe REI is a nonprofit. I'm, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know either. Hey, so I was looking at this, um, article that you sent me from August 2nd, uh, business insider by Henry Blodgett. Yeah. A friend of mine posted that on Facebook the other day and I read it and I had a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to say about it and just ended up, it just seemed like too much to deal with on Facebook at the time. <laughs> but I really like this article. Um, for the, for our listeners who are unfamiliar with it, the title is hate to say it, but if companies don't start paying people better, we need, we may need unions. Um, and so the, the author goes through a bunch of reasons why, um, you know, why he's always hated the idea that we need labor uh, unions. And then he goes through and talks about the minimum wage and uh, how corporate profits are up radically, how wages are at an all-time low. Uh, he's got charts in the whole thing. And even as a chart that suggests that when unions were their most powerful, that that's when uh, the wage gap between the rich and uh, the working class was at its uh, lowest level. Um, so I, I thought this was really neat. And I, I agree. We should have more unions. You should, unions should be stronger. In what way? Every way. Every, every voluntary, uh, consensual way that they can be. Uh, they should be they should be a strong and powerful force. For me, I see unions as being right up there with mutuals uh, and co-ops, um, mutual aid societies. The whole deal, it's basically an organization. Uh, it's, it's an example of, uh, what's that called? A voluntary association, people working together to better improve their lot using collective bargaining. I, I have no problem with it. I, I would love to see stronger unions. I, I think that they've been stamped out by, by a combination of corporate and government power uh, over the last, what, 40, 40 50 years. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a problem with unions per se. I think my problem with them is the government protection of them. You know, so if the union decides they want to strike, the company they're striking against can't go out and just replace them with other workers. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it goes without saying that there there shouldn't be any government uh, at all, of course, but no no government protection of either side. Yeah, and I think I think that's what leads to a lot of the reasons this guy hates unions. You know, they can, they basically, they're, they're protected by the government essentially. So, you know, they hold this threat of strike over the company and the government says, well, you got to deal with those people. You can't deal with other people. And that's what leads to a lot of these um, problems the guy mentions, you know, specifically that unions try and they start trying to base um, pay and other things on seniority rather than skill among the employees. Um, so, yeah, I don't have a problem with unions either. Um, but I think a lot of these, pro a lot of the problems this guy has with unions come from the stem from the fact that the government protects them legally. Of course, right now, uh, I mean, the government also protects the corporations and right now the balance of power is radically out of, out of kilter there because the government has protected the corporations in a huge, huge way while also stamping out the, uh, the unions in a huge way. Yeah. I, yeah, I absolutely agree with you there. And that's kind of, that's kind of the problem is, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to argue against union, you know, the government protection of unions so long as the government's going to continue protecting corporations. And I think that our argument, you know, there are people out there. I once heard a woman, I uh, was waiting in the checkout stand at the supermarket and she was saying, you know, somebody has to keep an eye on what business is doing. And, uh, you know, has to, has to keep an eye, regulate, make sure they're not screwing up and stuff. And I thought, you know, that's completely reasonable. Somebody should be keeping an eye on, on these things. Um, and you know what? If the unions were more powerful, maybe we wouldn't have the runaway corporations that we have today. You know, when Monsanto, uh, you know, does its crazy nonsense of, uh, you know, of just polluting to the max these fields um, or, you know, creating the situation where people pollute to their ma the max their fields with uh, Roundup, glyphosate, 
you know, maybe their union could just go on strike. And that would be a really effective uh, check against uh, their power. Yeah, if uh, I'm, I'm not sure that a company's employees are the best check on their power. You know, this guy um, who writes this article, I read a bunch of his stuff last night um, preparing for this morning, and he writes a lot about how he thinks um, employees should be paid better and they should be a bigger part of the company, um, all of which I agree with. But eventually what he says is that makes a lot of these problems with unions go away. You know, he's the first point he has against unions is that it creates this us versus, versus them culture within companies. Um, and I think that if, you know, employees were paid better and stuff, they would start working for the company. Um, and I think they would be less entitled or less likely to be a check on them. I mean, I think that's kind of consumer's job. But the problem there is that corporations are protected. So when Monsanto does something you don't like, you can't just go out and start and, you know, a better version of Monsanto because the government has raised the bar so high. Mm. Well, the thing with consumers is, for example, you know, me as a consumer, I go to the supermarket and, you know, I might I don't eat cereal. But uh, if I was going to buy a box of cereal, I just look at the box and I'm like, OK, that looks pretty healthy. Let's try that. You should totally eat cereal. I'm a big fan. <laughs> I, I, eat, I eat oatmeal. We've got, uh, yeah, I eat that too. I've got boxes and boxes of cereal around here. Oh, yeah. Cereal's anyway. overpriced. But anyway. That could be, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I look at the box and I'm like, okay, it looks pretty healthy. Let's, let's go with that. But I have no idea if it was produced responsibly. I have no idea if anybody was killed in the making of it. I have no idea what ingredients go into it. I have no idea what corners are being cut. But the employees, the the people who are there, who make the decisions, who see the decisions being made, who who actually make it, they know it. And uh, you know, if they are more empowered, I think that it will be easier for for us to have more corporate whistleblowers. And frankly, we need them. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I might be selling employees a little short, but it, you know, in the case you're talking about, that information is out there. You know, people, there's somebody out there, you may not know when you look at two boxes of cereal, but there's some guy out there. I mean, this is kind of one of the things I've been surprised about after running the, my TSA run and just dealing with people and becoming more and more familiar. I mean, there's people out there who are interested in everything under the sun. Mm-hmm. So there's some guy out there who's just obsessed with what companies are doing to put, you know, in their cereal, I'm sure. You know, he's all, he's all up about their, their practices and, you know, ingredients and that kind of thing. So, you know, maybe you don't know, but my experience has been there's somebody out there who's interested in everything. You know, there's a, I don't want to say one person's interested in everything, but, you know, there's a person out there who's interested in that, I'm sure. And has decided to make a life of publishing that information. Although, you know, some of the most damning information comes from inside. And, um, you know, for example, what's that that movie with, uh, what's her name, the pretty woman (laughs) actress? (laughs) <laughs> Julia Roberts. Yeah, where she, you know, there's this tremendous environmental damage um, and people this are dying. Is the dying. Pelican Brief? Mm, or no, 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 no. It's the one with the water, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I the can't name remember of it. the name. I it, like it'll that come movie. to me in like two seconds in the middle of a sentence of yours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a – no, and civil action is something different. But that's that's kind of that's kind of the same thing Similar. with John Travolta. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so, I mean, a lot of the most damning information in that came from people on the inside, people who uh, are or were employees. And well, we need... the government's a perfect example of that. Yeah. Well, I mean, look at Edward Snowden. Um, yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. And uh, Bradley Manning. So, you know, I, I, that's why I think it's it's we can't ignore the, the employees. And also, um, as libertarians, as libertarians who want to market our message – um, we have to keep in mind that we are, you know, we're often painted as the guys with the, the top hat and the monocle, you know? Yeah. And I thought that was going to be me since you were, since the original question was, you know, who's the problem <laughs> corporations or the government. And so I was going to say, let me put on my cane, you know, get my cane out and put my monocle on. <laughs> and so if we, uh, come out and support unions, strong unions, strong, voluntary, non-aggressive unions, then that's that like gives people on the left, the status left, like a double take. You know, they're like, huh? You know, these guys support unions. No way. Those guys are the top hat and monocle guys. And so from a marketing perspective, it's really powerful if we come out in support of strong unions. 
Yeah, it's it's kind of hard too because you know a lot of times when you say you want to come out and talk in favor of unions, you know what people hear, you know the the unwashed masses, as it were, <laughs> you know what they hear is you're coming out in support of government protected unions. Well, yeah, well that, we, that would have to be clarified. Yeah, I mean, sure, but yeah, I mean, I've got no problem with a bunch of people voluntarily getting together and saying, "Hey, we're not going to work at this price." I mean. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. You know, my problem comes when the government comes in and says, you can't hire other people if these people decide to strike against you. Yeah. But mm-hmm. it's, you know, it, it's at the same time, like I was saying a few minutes ago, it's hard to have that argument while government is also protecting corporations. Um, you know, while I was preparing for this, I was thinking um, about the BP spill from a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the government capped their liability at something like $75 million, I think it was. <laughs> You know, so like this lady in the supermarket, you know, she's talking about how, you know, somebody needs to watch these people, you know, and presumably she was referring to the government needs to keep an eye on them. But it traditionally does a terrible job. Like I said, BP's liability was limited to like $75 million in that case. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I ended up writing something at the time about the BP spill. And I was basically like, you know, without the government, you know, whoever, somebody would have owned the area where BP wanted to drill. And whoever that is, what is, you know, BP said, hey, we want to come in and drill. And that person would have said, all right, well, you need to show me that either you're not going to spill any oil here or create environmental damage or do whatever, or you need to show me how you're going to clean it up if you do. And so BP would have gone out and they would have hired some insurance company to to um, insure, the, insure their operations. And I guarantee you that insurance company would have climbed so far up BP's <laughs> rear end. <laughs> Because no insurance company wants to pay out billions of dollars when BP spills oil. Yeah, you know. So if you know if it all if it was all working under a, a you know a true laissez faire system, you know the probably spill probably wouldn't have happened in the first place because this insurance company would have made so much sure that BP wasn't going to cause the spill. Yeah, although I don't know if laissez faire is the right word there. Um, I, I would you know say an, in a you know in a stateless society situation. Why not? I mean, does well, that mean something different has, for you? You know, laissez-faire basically means anything goes. I mean, that's well, the I translation, think it, I think right? It literally, I thought it literally means let it be. Uh, yeah, okay, similar. So, and, for, and I think it has connotations of like, uh, you know, complete liberty, but not necessarily complete responsibility, you know, which is what really makes liberty work, in my opinion. It's the uns, unsung hero of libertarianism, responsibility. I'm kind of I, I, yeah I, I agree with you, but I kind of sound I'm kind of think to me I'm hearing you say laissez faire means anything goes, but like I said in in a stateless society or absent you know a government watchdog anything doesn't just go. I mean I kind of get the mm-hmm. sense you're saying yeah that's hey, why well, I don't like the laissez faire word because it could be misleading to people who aren't in on our conversation you know on our general oh, community oh. conversation. All right, I follow you then. Because I was going to say, I mean, it's not anything. I mean, it's anything goes to the extent that two people agree that, you know, they're in the whatever interaction they're going to have, anything goes. Yeah. But like I said, in this case of BP, you know, whoever they need to lease or rent the land from, that guy's not going to be like, oh, yeah, just start drilling and don't worry about the damage. I'll clean it up when you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's that's over and over and over again where government is basically just – Wiping corporations' butts, you know, keep, you know, like, hey, go, you know, pick pick you up or clean clean up your mess, go on back out and make another one, you know. Well, and, that, and that's my big problem is government is basically a giant moral hazard. You know, mm-hmm. people think, oh, well, we've got a watchdog here, so whatever this corporation is doing must be okay because otherwise the government would be stopping them. Yeah, oh, that's that's and that's a very widespread belief. You know, if it's going on, it must be okay. Otherwise, the government would stop them. And that is so simplistic – and so wrong. It's so passive. Uh, that that's a very insidious idea. It is, and like, I, but I think that's that's exactly what's going on. So you know, it was funny. You would ask the question on on your Facebook page, and also on uh, the Art of Liberty Facebook page. You know, who's the bad guy? Uh, corporations or the government? Mm-hmm. And I was very impressed with our twelve listeners. <laughs> <laughs> what? Because our audience they seemed- grew by four hundred percent. It certainly seemed that way. What did we do? I want to do it again. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe we should. Maybe we should ask. <laughs> yeah. um, they all. It all seemed like they caught on right away. That that's kind of it's it's like it's what you like to call a false dichotomy. 
Mm. You know, the, um, I, you know, I, if you, if you ask me and you made me choose one or the other, I would say the government is the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, a lot of them seem to catch on to the idea that corporations are protected by the government or enabled by the government. And so, excuse me, you know, my thing is that corporations aren't, aren't necessarily the problem. I mean, how else are people going to get together and, you know, achieve whatever ends that they can't achieve by themselves? Hmm. Um, but so, I mean, my problem isn't with the corporation per se, it's their protection from the government or enabling by the government. Yeah, it's such a tricky problem because people on on the right say it's the government and people on the left say it's corporations. And so uh, they're always at war over this. And um, and you know it's 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 it sounds glib to say well it's both, or and if you say it's just the government, then people on the left are like ah oh, you're just a extreme rightist, and if you say <laughs> it's the corporations, people on the right are like communist, <laughs> pinko, you know. So it's such right. a charged issue. It's so hard even to talk about it, you know, without people like freaking out and blocking you on Facebook and you know sending you hate mail and stuff. Yeah, I mean, arguably, <laughs> if you made the government go away, the corporate, the problem on the corporate side would take care of itself. I don't know, though. I don't know because um, I, I don't know, but I, I do think that you know the main question is it's it's very tricky because the government is you know is obviously a bad guy here because they use aggression to to do everything. But then the corporations, you know, you get some guys in there with with a lot of money. And they're like, you know, hey, you know, we, we could compete on quality and, you know, and, you know, good service and all that. Or we could just go to the government and get them to pass a law. And, uh, and you know, we have a solid income stream for the next 10 years until we have to, you know, pay them a few million again, you know, campaign donations and start all over again. Um, and so, And that's what they do. They actively collude with the people in government. And so they do kind of become one one entity there to a certain extent right but i but what i'm saying but what i was what i had said is if you get rid of the government from this equation doesn't the corporate problem take care of itself well i don't know because um, that, that was kind of where you started going but then you brought the government back into it and i thought we were getting rid of the government i don't know i'm he <laughs> i'm hesitant to say to say yes to that question because there there are a lot of for example if the government went away today the corporations would still have a lot of ill-gotten gains that they could use to continue oppressing people. Okay, but but like I said, if the government goes away, don't all the barriers to entry to competing with those corporations go away? Well, they would still have all those ill-gotten gains that would that would enable them to produce at a lower price. Don't you think? Oh, well, they would, but that's going to be costly and expensive. I mean, the fact that they exist at some at some level now kind of implies that they're inefficient, right? I mean, they've got government protection, so they're certainly not operating efficiently as they could be. Mm, I don't know. I don't know if that I mean, necessarily follows. That's where all these profits are coming from. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, you've got some guy who wants to, you know, I mean, you could you could use fast food as an example. I mean, that's kind of been in the news right now. Um, you know, you could have some guy start up, you know, another fast food chain. So yeah, maybe maybe McDonald's has a bunch of money and they can try and undercut this guy and put him back out of business, but that costs McDonald's a lot of money. I mean, that's not a long-term strategy. Eventually, they're going to run out of those ill-gotten gains trying to undercut their competition and eventually they're either going to have to compete on the same level as that other as these other upstarts or they're going to have to go out of business. That that's a good point. That's a very good point. Although I don't think I'm not sure it's possible to compete with McDonald's on on price, but definitely on quality. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a chain here um, where I live called In-N-Out. I don't know if you're familiar with them or if you've heard of them at all. No. Um, they're very small. I think they own less than 100 restaurants. Um, and I actually bought a book on about them a while back and read all about them. It's, they're, it's a really interesting story. Um, you should look it up. Yeah. It's good reading. If you, it's good reading if you've got some time. Yeah, there's, there's a little bit of personal stuff going on, which kind of keeps it interesting. But the guy who runs the place, or at least did, the original owner, he started it back in, I think, the 40s or 50s. Mm -hmm. And he started the first one by himself, you know, him and his wife um, started this little drive through. And as they grew their business, he was a real stickler for only buying the highest quality ingredients, 
Um, he made sure that the company owned the land where their store sat. You know, he would never just get himself leveraged by renting the land mm -hmm. kind of thing. So they expanded really slowly. But um, where I was going with this is they pay their employees really well. Like they start at something like 10 or $12 an hour, I think. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, I mean, they start well above the minimum wage. And it's really it, – it's if you ever come to California or I think they're starting to expand like into the southwest, you should try and go to one because the employees, when you go there, they're always really happy and friendly. Hmm. And it's – they actually try to hire those types of people. Like if you don't – if your personality is not that way, you just tend not to last there. <laughs> but, um, you know, they – I think that's just kind of the way they do it, you know. So, um, but like I said, they pay their employees really well and you get a free meal while you're on the shift. Like I think it's like one free meal a day mm -hmm. and they make really high quality food. Oh, really? It's you high know, quality. Yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah. You know, like somebody actually cooks your – I think the, the – one at least when I was reading the book, they were saying only the manager is actually allowed to cook the burgers even. Oh, wow. You know, so like they'll have, you know, quote unquote regular employees like making the fries and stuff like that. But only managers and assistant managers are actually allowed to operate the grill and cook the burgers. So how does it compare as far as price to McDonald's? I think it's I think it's actually cheaper. I'm trying to it's really? you know my wife yeah my wife usually runs out and buys it for us but usually the both of us eat for around 10 or 11 dollars. Um and McDonald's is usually I want to say like a couple dollars more. Mm. Wow. That's impressive yeah. then. That's really impressive. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's kind of, but that's kind of the point I'm making is, you know, they're obviously, they're, they're expanding more slowly. So I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's why they can do that. They're not leveraged up kind of thing. Are they a franchise? Exactly. They're not. I think uh, as far as I know, it. every, every store is family owned still, you know, it's actually owned by this family and they have some trust set up so that nobody outside the family can ever own it. <laughs> but like, it's, it's kind of, like I said, if you, if you actually read the story, it's, it's real weird and interesting. And now I think like the granddaughter, like the step granddaughter, some kind of the granddaughter is like the original is like the sole owner now. Cause basically everybody's been dying off. I mean, there's even like the plane crash where the corporate executives all get in a crash. And, oh man. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting story, but like I said, the company actually runs itself very well. They pay their employees well, um, and yeah, it's totally private. They're not a public company at all. But that that's the kind of business the one that what you're describing is the kind of business that I, I just love because you know they're they're doing it right. I mean, they're not cutting corners. They're not focusing on you know how much we're going to make in the next month, um, and they're producing a quality product and they're paying their employees well. I mean, that, yeah, so, I mean, imagine if so, we had, you know, we don't need like a, like a global conglomerate McDonald's, it, it, you know, if we had like 50 or a hundred of these companies across the globe, just like this one or a thousand or 10,000 and, and that would be enough, you know, and you wouldn't need to, to own uh 1 million outlets, you know, your 100, I'm sure would provide for you very well. But that's what I mean. That's kind of my point, though. I mean, look, here's a company that's competing. You know, I mean, maybe they're not on the same level as McDonald's. Like I said, I think they've only owned like 100 stores and they're all in the southwest here. But they're obviously doing very well for themselves, you know, even even with the government intervention in the market. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, without that intervention to prop up McDonald's and protect their protect their, you know, space in the market. Like I said, I think this company would probably expand a lot more quickly. Yeah. It's a good point. It's a good point. It's very interesting. You've rendered yeah, me it's... speechless. <laughs> that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> no. So back to this original article, though. This guy, it was it was interesting to me too because he was talking about um, unions and how they create this us versus them, and they create a culture of entitlement, mm -hmm. and you know they they force companies to treat them, all their employees equally, regardless of relative skill. Um, I I thought that was very very interesting because at least you know I don't know if my company touts it as much now as they as they did in the past but I remember the place where I work they put out um the annual report you know a couple years into my tenure there mm -hmm. and in one of them it was basically like you know our employees really love this company and we've never had a union you know kind mm -hmm. of you know as if you know unions basically only form when companies treat their employees employees badly was kind of the the that was kind of the subtext. Yeah, that was the subtext of there. <laughs> um, but over the past, you know, 10 years or so that I've been there, all of these reasons that this guy hates unions have kind of started to pop up, at least in my opinion. Mm -hmm. 
And so I was kind of like reading this and I was kind of like, you know, you don't need unions to create this kind of problem. Um, so I was kind of curious. I mean, I don't think it's a question we're going to answer necessarily, but I was, I've never worked anywhere else besides this company. So I was kind of curious if just the, the wage disparity that is borne out by these charts in this article is what's leading to that. You know, employees are starting to be paid less and they're just kind of becoming resentful of their employers. And so they start to think of the management of the company is different from the quote unquote employees of the company, Mm -hmm. you know, and that whole thing. And, you know, yeah, I don't know. And I I don't think I've ever actually been a member of a union. Although I remember when I was driving a a taxi in uh, Chicago in the, in the nineties, uh, all, you know, we weren't really employees. We were all free agents. Um, that's how they structured the business there in Chicago. And, uh, and there was constant talk of forming a union. Okay. Uh, yeah, to, to kind of defend ourselves against the, the cab companies and the city of Chicago. But, um, and that, that was mainly because the, I think the, the, the cab companies on the one hand were just squeezing us out, putting, making us do, uh, car repairs, um, charging like tons of money for a car, uh, every day. And then Did the they city, make you own the car? No, no, we we could we could rent it, and but then you had to pay for the repairs too. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't. That's that's a pretty crappy deal. It was hard. It was really hard to make money uh, to make any kind of decent money driving a cab. Um, and then on the other side, the city of Chicago was uh, was strictly uh, limiting the number of new taxi medallions that they were issuing every year. And so the old timers were especially upset about that because they were in a lottery um, to, to potentially win one, um, you know, in order. And that was something they, they instituted in order to give some balance between the drivers and the uh, and the companies. But nothing really came of it because I think most of the uh, drivers were were foreign foreigners, really. Uh-huh. Didn't even most of them didn't even speak English very well, and they're for them all the, the money they earned was like manna from heaven, and they would they would just come and they would you know drive like nuts and uh, you know like eighteen twenty hours a day uh, for a couple months, and then they would return to to Pakistan or Kenya or uh, Russia or where, wherever with like a really nice nest egg. Really, after a couple months of work, yeah. Yeah, because nice. they they would you know if you worked yourself like a mule, you know, and you got the car cheap, and you know you knew people because they were also from your country and whatever, you could make good money. Oh, but yeah, if, kind of live together and share expenses. Yeah, uh huh. But you know, if you were if you were like dealing direct with Yellow Cab, the biggest company, um, you you know you would get better cars, uh, but it was also a lot more expensive. Yeah, so there was so there were multiple companies there then competing with each other. It sounds like yeah, there's yellow uh, yellow cab, which is the biggest. There's checker, which is I, I think it's actually a cooperative of drivers. Um, and then there's some smaller companies like Flash, and I forget the other ones. Uh, yeah, but basically, so yellow cab is the big the big one there, or at least it was at that time. I don't know yeah, if anything's seems- changed. Seems like that medallion program creates some kind of artificial scarcity in the market. It does. It absolutely does. And it was definitely that that marketplace was definitely like um, you know, the you know, yellow cab, they were just the, the monster there. They they I mean, they just controlled so much. And then the government, on the other hand, the city of Chicago has uh an agency that's in charge of regulating and you have to, if you want to drive, you have to uh, take a course and pass a test and and they give you your license to drive a taxi and so they regulate the drivers and they regulate the companies apparently it's harder to drive a taxi than a regular car so you need some <laughs> extra test <laughs> yeah basically it was on it was on the map maps the city of chicago um you know what, on, the city makes you prove that you know where you're going yes yes but it doesn't doesn't at, the that just strikes me as one of those things where, like, the market would weed out a company that hires drivers that don't know where they're going all on its own. Like, you don't need to hire to have some government agency collecting taxes for that purpose. Yeah, but uh, but at the same time, because of the artificial scarcity, 
um, you know, they, they created a situation where, you know, drivers, I mean, where that, 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 you know, the market really wasn't operating well. Yeah. The government in- intervention begets more interve- intervention begets more intervention. Yeah. And so not only were the, were, were, were we drivers getting screwed by the big, by, by a company like yellow, um, but, um, on the other hand, the government was also screwing us because they were collecting all fees and whatnot um, to for the licenses. Um, they were artificially limiting, you know, the number of medallions that were in play, and so that raised the price of how much we had to pay to rent a car with a medallion for the day. And also, um, complaint. You know, I, there would occasionally be complaints. I had one complaint in two and a half years. Uh, and, um, basically what, there was no, the hearing was over the phone. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't even get a chance to know who made the complaint against me or to cross examine this person. And it was was one of these administrative kangaroo courts. Yeah. It was assumed from the very moment that I got on the phone that I was guilty. Well, why Um, else would this person have complained? Yeah, right. (laughs) And so like, and this was, this was the thing with everybody, every, I heard so many other stories of people. Uh, telling me th- these, you know, how they got screwed over because of some complaint. And in order to to, to be able to continue, um, you know, driving and keep my my license in in proper order, I had to pay them a fine. And it was a pretty hefty fine. I think it was a couple hundred dollars. And so, at, at oh wait, least- wait, wait, wait. So, so the person, the the group running the court and making these decisions is the same group that collects the fines when you, you're found guilty. You bet. Oh, you a big bet. surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and so really in this little microcosm in the city of Chicago, I mean, this is how it worked uh, 15 years ago. Well, you have, you know, the corporation on one hand, the government on the other hand, and both working together to screw over to the little guy and milk him for as much money as you can. Yeah. So like I said, I, I agree with you that they're working together, but I think like as a number of people also pointed out in the comments to your question originally is that the use of force is the problem here. So if you get rid of the government, like I said, I I'm convinced that these problems would work themselves out. Yeah. So, Hey, let's take a look at some of the comments. So Corey Moore, he says both, but you, it sounds like you disagree with that. Well, like I said, I think, I think they're both the, I think they are both the problem in, you know, like I think, I think our conversation has kind of borne that out. You know, the government exists in, you know, in whatever capacity and corporations basically see the government as the shortest path to collecting profits. So they basically get in bed with the government. But mm. I think that that the corporations getting in bed with the government is a symptom of the problem, not the problem itself. Mm-hmm. So I think if you get rid of the problem, in my opinion, the government, the problem with the corporations would work itself out. Yeah. So uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. I've, I've been friends with with um, her for on Facebook for quite a while, but I've never actually talked to her in real life. <laughs> Bretigny, I think Schaefer, she says it doesn't matter who the bad guys are; bad systems are the problem. You know, I was going to say maybe maybe if she can call in and leave us a voicemail about how to pronounce her name, and then also ask a question while she's doing that. <laughs> <laughs> that is so clever. <laughs> I like that idea. <laughs> Um, we'll take, we'll take the abuse if, it, if she'll also ask a question. Yeah. We'll pay any price for a question. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not get crazy now. <laughs> um, so bad systems. Hmm. Uh, I, I think that's kind of like, I, said, I think that's similar to what I was just saying. Yeah. So Linda, uh, Ang says the two working in cahoots is what ends up being so bad. Yeah, see, this I is what think... I was saying. I thought your readers were very astute that it's not necessarily, you know, one or the other, at least, you know, looking at the the problem as the whole. But like I said, I, I view the corporations getting in bed with the government as a symptom of a deeper seated problem. Hmm. Uh, Virgil, he says that are either one of them real things? I, I didn't I didn't follow that. Do you know what he meant there? I think that he, he I, I guess that he might be saying that. Uh, government is just a fiction. It doesn't really exist because it's just a group of individuals. Has he evolved beyond the idea of government? Uh, Yes. Yes. Uh (laughs) (laughs) And corporations, likewise, are just a group of individuals. So maybe that's his point. Yeah, well, I think, think, well, that's what I would argue, but I think at least in the current system, corporations are a fiction, you know, basically created by the government under their legalities. 
Hmm. So I wondered. That's probably more what he's getting at, I would think. Yeah. William so, yeah, Fred- I kind of I kind of understood the do corporations really exist, but yeah, I didn't follow the government. I was like, the government exists, but like I said, he's more involved, more evolved than I am. Nah, <laughs> well, no, nah, nah, I don't evolve beyond beyond government. He's certainly an anarchist, that's for sure. Yeah. So William Fred says the bad guy is the use of force. Yeah, I and agree. That's, I don't know. That seems like a, a little bit simplistic. I think you know, and caps and uh, and you know, libertarian anarchists sometimes we're a little bit too too glib and um and that's i think that's that's can be a marketing fail on our end because people yeah, think I, you know i think i think his answer is right i think it could use some you know more explanation to the people who don't understand what he's saying but at least for me i agree okay um <laughs> let's see <laughs> penny langford freeman says uh anyone who profits from enforces or enables tyranny is the bad guy Hmm. Although, you know, anyone who profits from tyranny. So um, then the question is, you know, if you if you work at a corporation, if you work for the government, if you collect, uh, let's say, veterans benefits, uh, if you use Medicaid, are you profiting from from tyranny? I don't know. I suppose we'd have to analyze your tax tax receipts, right? Uh, to see whether it was a net uh, net gain yeah, or net loss. Yeah, I mean that that statement for me that's a little overly broad. I think. Yeah. In in my mind, it, I have a hard time faulting people who who want to set up a corporation and decide to pay whatever government extortion fees in the forms of licenses and that kind of thing. I have a hard time faulting them for trying to run a business. You know, it's in the general sense. I think people run a business. You know, maybe profit is why they do it, but at some level, they're helping consumers. Mm. and making the world a better place by providing a service that consumers want to pay for. Mm. So I have a hard time faulting them just for that. I think at the point at which they decide, all right, we need some kind of government protection for our market and go start lobbying for legal protections, that's where my problem comes in. Although it's tricky business because if you get that far in where you're, you're let's say you set up an LLC you know, in order to – avoid uh some uh self-employment taxes or or excessive payroll taxes and then the government's like okay we're going to raise um taxes or we're going to pass this law and you're like hey these guys are going to screw me over and then you know like some kind of lobbyist organization comes along and says you know buy a membership and we'll stand up for small business you know so then if you if you buy that if you if you get into that well then you're effectively paying lobbyists yeah, I mean, you're on affection. behalf of corporate interests, but maybe right. you only did it out of self-defense. What do you think about that? Yeah, see that that's where I I have a problem with that. That's and I I've heard this argument go round and round and round and I think in this case at least for me I don't own a business. Um so I'm but I don't vote, you know, I'm kind of willing to unilaterally disarm in that in that sense. Mhm. Um I'm 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 a believer that I hate to say voting is violence, but essentially that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my in my opinion, the government the government exists, and to the extent that it does, it's going to do what it wants. And mm-hmm. I don't think that my participating in that system is going to change it to any appreciable degree. Mm-hmm. So I'm willing to walk away and not support it. Yeah, I I, I have own businesses um i had a pretty sizable business uh there for a while and um and before i was really conscious of all this i i actually did set up uh i think it was an llc to you know to avoid um you know some excessive taxation there and um it's a tough call I, i i wouldn't get involved in lobbying just because like it's just like too much it's like you know, okay. If you're gonna screw me over, just just do it. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to play the game with you. You know, just come right out and do it. But uh, I can understand other people doing it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, think, I can't endorse it, but I can understand. I think. Yeah, I certainly understand it. I but yeah, and like I said, I think my my job or my my position on the whole thing is I try and exist. You know, absent the government as much as possible. Basically, you know, so business doesn't really have that luxury. Yeah, you know. They're, they And it seems like businesses being a smaller percentage of the population have a greater chance of having their lobbying efforts 
work. Hmm. So a, a non-libertarian friend of mine, uh, his name is Ken, he says that there can never be justice on stolen land. Yeah, I I don't know what to say. I mean, this this kind of strikes me as the the slavery argument, you know, and people should pay reparation to the families of people who were slaves back in the mm -hmm. 1800s. Mm -hmm. And I'm not I, I understand what he's saying, but I'm not sure what he or what he would suggest to correct that problem. Hmm. Yeah, I, I sympathize with the idea that uh, it is stolen land, that all, all of the Americas are to one extent or, or another stolen land. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, so what do we do about it? Well, that, that was kind of my question. We basically wipe out private property and basically let everybody go homestead and start from scratch? Or, I mean, that doesn't seem like a very send, send everybody back, back to Africa, I mean, Europe? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they I can build know. boats, and the first one back wins. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and then Brian Jones had a really interesting comment. I thought it was pretty uh, perceptive. perceptive. Um, he says the way that the state has codified and empowered corporations has made them into a powerful tool to keep wealth and power in the hands of the one per percent. Uh, special privileges have given hierarchical corporate institutions an artificial economy of scale and an unfair competitive advantage over small, smaller, more independent or egalitarian types of enterprises. Uh, the problem is state-sanctioned corporations uh, bec have become a way to leverage state violence. Yeah, uh, this guy said this guy said exactly what I would have said if I was smart. <laughs> no, you're smart. You're so I read I read this one last night, and I think I actually clicked the like button on it. But yeah, he said exactly what I was thinking. Or you know, if I was able to put my thoughts into words, that's what I would have said. But you know what? And th this is this is interesting because th that's basically a left libertarian analysis. And I see ANCAPs and people more who sound more like people on the right, but are but are anarchists. And they're left libertarianism. You know, you guys are pinkies and commos, and, uh, pinkos and commies, and you know. <laughs> But the, but that's 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 it. That that's a basic. That's a really solid left libertarian analysis in a few words on this question. And basically, it's just uh, for you know you could say in a sense that whereas we had a glib answer earlier, which is more characteristic of an ANCAP, this this is basically very similar, but it's a it's not glib. It's more detailed and it's more acceptable to people on the left as well. It's, it's a left libertarian analysis. Yeah, see, I I always thought people would, or I always thought I would have been considered a right libertarian. Yeah, no, I think you are. Apparently, well, apparently I'm a left libertarian. I agree with this guy. <laughs> Wonders never cease. <laughs> yeah, like I, I mean, I I, I kind of have a problem with the whole left right thing. It seems like libertarianism that those level those labels don't seem to apply. Kind of, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but I think I, I used to think that as well. But I think that they do. They they do. I think they have a foundation in reality. I think that the right is more, you know, more more like hold on, let's not advance too quickly. You know, let's 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 respect the the, the current power structures. You know, let's not get too crazy, guys. Whereas the left the is conservatism. like conservatism. Yeah. Whereas the the left is more like fuck this shit. Let's do what's right. <laughs> Let's do it now. And tradition can go jump out the window, you know? And, uh, and I, yeah. I, I like, I like that general. And I, I think we have, I think that, that exists that there are people who have generally right or left, uh, dispositions. And, uh, and I, I like the left one better. You know, it doesn't mean I'm a communist. You know, it doesn't mean that like, Che Guevara is my hero, even though I wrote a post about how I admire some aspects of his character. Um, Do you have his T-shirt, which has, which has earned me the um, the absolute hate of certain people in the community, <laughs> which is hilarious. <laughs> um, but you know, I'm more like I, I kind of like this this focus, this leftist thing, where it's kind of like you know, fuck this shit, let's just do what's right, let's do it now. I don't give a shit about your <laughs> patriarchal power structures, you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I I always just thought left libertarians were basically anti-property. Well, yeah, basically <laughs> anti-property rights. 
Well, there, there is, there is, see the, the whole, pro, I always, you know, I would, when I was younger, my dad, like he sat me down one day to talk about communism. You know, this was when the cold war was still on and whatnot. And he's like the commies and the commies and the commies want to do this and that. And I'm like, Oh my God, the communists are pure evil. And I, you know, I think there's, there's a more, there's, there's a gradient to it. And I've learned this from people like Kevin Carson and uh, the, the whole mutualism thing. Mutualism is kind of like a, a middle point in, in anarchism between the traditional anarchists and kind of the, the capitalist anarchists, in my opinion. And basically there's this idea that, uh, yeah, the, that the ownership of the property is whoever's using it, basically the usufruct idea. And it distinguishes between possession – which is basically, you know, like, okay, it's, it's, you know, I got it. I got it near to me. I'm using it on a regular basis. And absentee ownership, which is like, okay, I own a summer house in Hawaii and I go there once a year, you know, that kind of a thing. And so there, yeah, there are two different levels of property there. There's the, the possession, there's stuff I use, and then there's absentee ownership. There's stuff that, that I really don't use that much. I'm just holding it. Yeah, um, it's too bad we're getting to this so late in this episode, though, because we talk, we touched on this last week. But I have a real problem with the problem with absentee ownership. Mm -hmm. Okay, we should definitely talk about that next episode then. All right, let's do it. All right. <laughs> hey, so let's run through. We have a few comments on the Art of Liberty Facebook page, too. C.T. Jane says, the government is corporations. What do you think of that? Hmm. You, well, I guess we'd need to kind of try and work out what he's saying. What corporate that corporations basically run the government? Hmm. The government operates at the behest of corporations. He could be coming from two different places. I think one place is kind of like a sovereign citizen thing, where uh, because the sovereign citizens are always saying that the government, like they look up on on business directories. I forget what that's called. That there's that service, and it's like it shows the government's like. City of Chicago, City of Chicago, or Corporation of the City of Chicago, and then there are there. Are, so they sc share these screenshots and like, oh, look, the government is actually a corporation, you know. Um, Great. So the law, their laws don't mean anything because we're a voluntary society. Then, right? Yeah, you just have to <laughs> withdraw from the corporation. And uh, yeah, I, I think the sovereign citizen perspective is is interesting. I'm not sure how useful it is, but it's certainly interesting. Yeah, I, I love that they use these these arcane legal methods to prove their freedom. Yeah, <laughs> it's fascinating. It's fascinating how in detail they get. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've learned some useful things from people who've who've shared sovereign citizen type of arguments from me. Uh, w yeah. With me, sorry, with me. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm not I'm not sure what he means by the comment. I mean, this kind of goes back to your. It's a little too short to be. I, I hate to say that it's not useful, but if people don't understand your meaning, then <laughs> – Or he might mean that corporations have co-opted the government you know, because there's this revolving door of corporate executives that go uh, into government jobs and then they go back into their corporate jobs. Yeah, or just you know, reading it in light of the question, he might just be saying there's really no difference between the two of them in his mind. They're both the problem. Yeah. And uh, Chris Vanatter, he says both. You know, we've certainly seen that um, that response before. And I also got a bunch of responses on the Arm Your Mind for Liberty uh, Facebook page. I'll run through those real quick. Sean Lee oh, says, I "What's that?" No, you posted it there. Yeah, I didn't I got see a it bunch. there. Yeah, I've been following. I've been following the one on your page and on the Art of Liberty, but yeah, I didn't see the one on the Arm Your Mind for Liberty. Yeah. So Sean Lee says the lines are so blurred they've become nearly one and the same, each controlling the other. Yeah, uh, I can see that. Yeah, Pika Chan says collectivism. <laughs> I'm not sure. That one's t way too short for me to glean any meaning from it. Yeah. I, I think he basically is saying, I don't like your question. I'm going to give the answer <laughs> I want. <laughs> Which is certainly a very libertarian thing to do. <laughs> Screw your question. This is the answer. <laughs> uh, Lydia says, ultimately, it is government. Without which corporations would have no power, which is basically what you're saying, right? Yes, I need to go find that comment and like it. <laughs> um, Alex Knight says one is merely a construct of the other. I'm not sure. Uh, I think that's another one that's a little too glib, in my opinion. What do you think? Or at least at least too ambiguous. Yeah. 
I mean, I'm, assu- I'm assuming he's saying con- con- the con- corporations are a construct of the government. And Jake- I don't see it. I don't see it working the other way around. Hmm. Jake Mills says corporations are the government and vice versa. Uh, Brandon says both. James W. Bilson says companies only exist as quote unquote corporations because of the legal status and privilege granted to them by the government. No government, no corporations. Makes yes. sense. Yes. Yeah. Another. I need to go be friends with these people. <laughs> <laughs> and there, are, there are people who are like, "Hey, corporations? I don't, I don't, I don't have any problem with corporations." And so this person, Clay Cole, he says McDonald's isn't the one who gave me a ticket last week. That's all he says. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, I say, I mean, it's, it seems like he's appealing to the argument that the use of force is the problem. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, we have another both um, and uh, perhaps a, a sovereign citizen here. Kayla Wolf says, well, the, the, the government is actually a corporation. Um, yeah, I, f- I've, I find that argument very interesting because, like I said, I find conspiracy theories very interesting. Oh, yeah. Very entertaining. Yeah, but I don't, I don't see that that's the case. That the government is a corporation. I mean, this seems like it's going down the we're all under admiralty law, and you can tell this because <laughs> our flags have the yellow tassels <laughs> around the outside. And that's all, I mean, that's all very entertaining reading to me, but it just seems like it's way out there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, even if it's true, what does it change about what I'm, I should be doing? You know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> the other thing about that whole thing. But yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, because I always read that and I'm like, oh, great. Like we're under this admiralty law. Great. What does that mean? Like there must be some, you know, are they telling me this because there's some easier way to get out from under it? Or like you just have you know, to kind file of like... a notarized statement with your local <laughs> secretary of state and it's done. You're free. Nice. <laughs> um, great. And then the cops can't bother me anymore. Exactly. You just tell them that you are John of the Tyner and you are a free, <laughs> beautiful, independent human being and they'll just go Maybe. away. And maybe I can write a book explaining how to do this and make millions of dollars off of it by freeing everybody else. What an interesting idea. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Here's some other answers. Crony corporatists, can the two be separated? I honestly honestly do not see how corporations negatively affect my day-to-day life. I do notice government, though. And that's the same gentleman who said that McDonald's isn't the one who gave him the ticket last week. Ah, so he must have just hit enter. Instead of shift enter to keep commenting, uh, yeah, make two separate comments. Yeah. Um, although I I I I notice how corporations that negatively affect my day to day life. For example, they um you know they and their their employees uh, primarily fund these the politicians. I mean, the politicians would not be able to run these huge campaigns and have these, you know, sparkly, shiny, clean public images without corporate backing. Yeah, I, I and I know you don't like to read too much into people's comments, but the way I would read that is more that in li- especially in light of his McDonald's didn't give him the ticket, you know, he's he's not driving down the road and have some corporation pull him over and, you know, be like buy our burger, you know, we're going to take $5 from you and force you to eat this food or at least take this food. I mean, I think that's, I think that's kind of more the the direction he's coming from. Yeah. Although it's more subtle. I think, you know, I I think you're right. I think corporations do negatively impact our lives. I mean, look at, you know, Monsanto, which you brought up earlier. Hmm. And so I'll just give one final answer that I thought was interesting and unique. Uh, Barbara Burnett says that the real bad guys are insurance companies. Did she explain that comment at all? No. <laughs> oh. Well, you're a bad guy then, George. <laughs> well, actually, Shield Mutual is no longer uh, strictly an insurance company. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you're good. You're a good guy then again. I'm a good guy well, again. That was that was short lived. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I. Yeah, I, 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 would, I, I would be. I would. Lo- I would love to hear more. Or you know, I would love for her to explain that comment more and and understand what she means. Yes, so Barbara, maybe you can uh, give us a call. And yes, uh, you read my mind. <laughs> leave us a, uh, a you know your your explanation of uh, why the insurance companies are the bad guys, and maybe fit a question in there somewhere. Um, and the phone number for that is, uh, and everybody's invited to to give us a call. The phone number for that is six four one seven one five thirty nine hundred extension two. Five five eight eight eight. 
And, uh, you know, you can also get that at that, uh, you, that uh, number at uh, AYMFL.com slash T-A-O-L. So I think we had, we had a good conversation today, John. I think so. We meandered around quite a bit. And I'm looking forward to the next one talking about absentee ownership. Cause yeah. I want to he- hear about this. <laughs> All right. I'm going to start sharpening my blade right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening, and have a great week. Talk to you later, George. Okay. Bye, John.